Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good evening. You know, since last Tuesday's election results, I've been hammered with questions. Why, why, why? Why, why, why? Why, 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 why? So I'm going to get to some of that, a lot of that tonight. Um, you know, but if you're feeling, you know, we want more out of life, right? We're wondering how do we belong? How do we thrive? How do we get along with each other? And for me, it's, there's a solution here. It's to reboot our human operating system. So what's the first thing you do when your phone's not working? What's that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. What's the first thing you do? Easy th first thing you do is you reboot it, right? So I'm, when I'm on the phone with Apple Care, Spectrum, whatever, what's the first thing they tell you to do? Turn it off and on, right? So what about us? What, what about humans? So I think we need a, re a reboot because we have a lot of challenges we're facing right now. Industries are turned upside down. Social media is exposing how we don't know how to behave together and get along. You know, the world was blindsided by the COVID pandemic. Thank goodness we're pretty much through that now. You know, but as a result of all this, you know, there's a new paradigm we can step into, and that is being conscious human beings. But let's back up for a second. If you're like me, you want to be basking in the bliss of collaboration, right, instead of this. Wouldn't it be great if life was wonderful and we work, to play, we work and play together instead of like this? And very rarely are we walking around saying, I love everything and everyone. <laughs> With relationships, usually what happens is the boxing gloves come out. You know, this is probably familiar to you, right? And you're probably asking, like, why are we at each other's throats too much? Why, so much? Why are we so divisive? Why can't we all just get along? The world's a much different place today, largely due to technology. Well, what about polar bears and elephants? Okay, this is a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a setup. <laughs> now, if I, Abby, if I, Abby, were an animal, I'd be an elephant. And as an elephant, I would never interact with a polar bear. But here's the twist. I'm not an elephant. I'm a human being. And in a global gig economy, humans from different backgrounds are colliding like never before. So elephants and polar bears are actually meeting in ways that they never intended. So the problem here is they, have no, uh, they don't know how to interact. One is built for the freezing Arctic, the other for the soaked savanna, and for the sun-soaked savanna. And human interactions, they're way more complicated than that. So we're, we're colliding with each other from different cultures. So human polar bears and human elephants are actually interacting. And our human, current human operating system isn't equipped to handle that, which makes it challenging for us to navigate the interconnected world. So do you think it's time for an upgrade? And technology has been a tremendous gift. It's providing us with opportunities with artificial intelligence, we will continue to see exponential changes in how we exist and relate. In fact, technology is advancing faster than we are as a species. Here's my new ride. It's a game changer. I just upgraded it. My last bike was 17 years old. And I was so ready for this kind of leap. The tech these days is wild. You can see there's no wires on it. You know, it, it's hidden, it's sleek, there's powerful disc brakes on it, and it's not even electric. And get this, gone are the days of 120 uh, PSI. Now 40 PSI is the way to go. So who knew that tire inflation technology would get an upgrade? So even bikes are advancing faster than we are. It's crazy, right? A bit of a shout out to Piccadilly on A Street. Love them, yeah. If you need a bike, go to Piccadilly. And here I am on my bike. Don't I look great? <laughs> so artificial intelligence drew this in less than 30 seconds. How exciting that we can all start to see the implications of technology. Imagine me trying to draw that. 
So technology is speeding ahead while we're still playing catch up as a species. Think about how many times your phone or device gets updated. It's new versions come out almost every day, certainly every week. But us, we have not, as humans, updated our operating system. We're still running the same ancient software from the days when we were running from mammoths and trying not to be killed. Our, brain, our brains might still be stuck in prehistoric times, but everything else around us, you know, it's evolving at warp speed. It's time for an upgrade. So that's the invitation, is to move away from being cave people, to reboot from survival mode to being conscious and evolved human beings. Well, why does this matter now, do you think? Think about the late 1800s. Someone spent all day milking cows, growing their own food, even making their own clothes. They didn't really have time to argue about things. Someone spent all day creating widgets for work. Working in factories, we had our place in the assembly line. Even working at desks, accounting was all manual. Yeah, having worked, right? having worked on Wall Street, I shudder to think of the manpower to keep all the books and records, which is now totally automated. In previous times, people weren't working with each other. They each had their independent task on an assembly line. And people were literally moving their bodies more. This is the modern day version, which even that is going away, to be replaced with more technology. Do you think these robots ever argue with each other or worry about their behavior? No. And they are constantly upgraded with new software. We are truly in a global gig economy and modern world. I mean, look at this just PowerPoint presentation. I was able to just do that. Right. I mean, even PowerPoint right now is getting updated to do cool things like that. <laughs> so we have to be more skillful human beings now. Why is that? Yeah. You don't go crazy. Yeah. All of that, right? Because we work in teams. In today's information age, the most valuable commodity isn't gold or oil. It's actually the ability to collaborate and relate, share wisdom, knowledge, and ideas across the globe. Relating and collaborating are the skills of our time. But it's not just about working together, it's about being able to relate effectively. That's the game changer for today. Through cooperation, we can rise to the challenge of this world. Every industry is being disrupted by technology. Again, it's advancing faster than we are as a species. We're constantly playing catch up. So in the past, we always focused on what we do, the tasks, the goals, the outcome. It's really important to focus on that. However, there's an opportunity for us to double down on how we do what we do. So how do we get along while we're accomplishing what we need to? Fast forward to today, our work and existence is transformed. So keep focusing on the what, but we can double down on the how. And it all has to do with how we relate, how we behave. In their article, The C-Suite Skills That Matter Most, Harvard Business Review said that social skills are necessary today. They said when we refer to social skills, we mean certain specific capabilities, including a high level of self-awareness, the ability to listen and communicate well. You know, as I'm, you know, you're thinking of like what you see on the news and what's happened. A facility for working with different types of people and groups, elephants, polar bears, and what psychologists call theory of mind, the capacity to infer how others are thinking and feeling. While this article talks about the C-suite, this is true for everyone, in my opinion, in my experience, no matter who you are. This is true for all humans. Guess what now what? Now that we've gained control of the planet and are unfortunately harming it with that control, now that technology is advancing faster than we are as a species, now that for us at this event, you know, our food, clothing, and shelter are no longer pressing concerns, 
now in a privileged society where our basic needs are met, something new is emerging, a space for conscious thought and deeper human, a deeper human existence. Social skills don't just appear. They are born from human development. And in this interconnected world, we need advanced social skills to relate across cultures, to bridge divides, and to thrive in a global context. This is the next step in our human evolution. This is our opportunity to have infrastructure in place, a human reboot for our individual and collective behavior. Our modern world requires different skills, a reboot, a new release for our operating system to navigate the human condition consciously. Now, for instance, social media platforms create a forum for interactions. With an upgrade in our operating system, we can take responsibility for how we behave on social media and in life. Let's take a look at social media because it's, to me, it's the grand experiment for the human race. Social media has been an enormous gift, but it hasn't come without its challenges. To put this in perspective, in 1908, the Model T rolled off the assembly line. The US population then was about 88 million people. Now, imagine if we introduced today's high-tech cars, Porsches, Teslas, back in 1908. No modern infrastructure, no traffic lights. Today's population of about 330 million people trying to navigate that. It would be pure chaos, right? That's exactly what social media, what happened with social media. We were handed this powerful tool by still running an outdated operating system. Some argue we need to reform social media. And while I believe that's true, I'm suggesting we actually reform our behavior alongside the technology. It's time to reboot our humanity to keep up with the technology that we've created. And let's take a look at some examples here. This is really evident because one of the unforeseen gifts of social media, if you will, is it has it's exposed our most raw and even toxic humanity and our lack of skill in relating. For instance, it's pointing to us how we struggle to relate and coexist in the world. Now, this is Greta Thunberg. You can see this is from 2021. So she posted this on her page, right? And she's a minor at this point. You know, this is 2021. Here's a response. So someone attacking her as a minor for her pointing her view, pointing out her view. Here's another example. This is one of mine. This is back in 20, uh, 2019. Yeah, this is 2019. So I posted this on her page. This is what I said. In my opinion, you were masterful. Thank you. Hoping for VP one day, and one day you will be president. Well, we know what happened. It didn't happen. But notice how I am speaking what's true for me. I'm speaking my opinion. I'm not saying anyone's bad. And look what I got. <laughs> I'm sick. OK. Yeah, right? And then here's the next one. Will never happen, drawn and quartered for all the babies she's killed. Now, sorry, sorry. We don't have to agree with Greta's point of view or Vice President Harris's point of view, but you can see where behavior is the issue here. And again, people suggest we should reform social media. I'm suggesting we reform our behavior. We reboot our humanity. This is our opportunity. Let's take another look. Let's investigate a little bit more. That, is, that was created by AI, by the way, in less than 30 seconds. So as a solopreneur, you can imagine my job's getting easier. Thank goodness. Social media platforms create a forum, a gigantic forum, for free speech. This is a huge gift in the United States. But without an updated operating system, a human, an updated human operating system, free speech without conscious behavior is actually the blind spot of our time. 
because you know free speech is something, but remember, it's, it's dangerous to yell fire in a crowded theater, right? That's a, a basic. <clears throat> and it becomes a behavior issue then, not an issue of free speech. People can be hurt or die from some of the things that happen. And let's be absolutely clear, the verbal punches we throw at each other are just as equally, are equally as harmful as physical punches. We know this scientifically. Doesn't matter if you punch someone or scream and yell at them, the body knows no difference. So it's time for a human reboot. We can take responsibility for our behavior in every circumstance. So enter conscious leadership and humanity. This is the new operating system for now and the future. So some of you may have heard some terms like awakened, mindful, transformational, intentional, enlightened. I like conscious because it's actionable and applicable. Because to be conscious means to have heightened awareness for my impact on myself, others, and my environment. And then this loop of awareness then can keep me learning. So if I'm aware of how I'm impacting you, me, the environment, then I can learn from that and say, oh, I've caused harm and take responsibility, or that's going well. And then I'm constantly learning, which is absolutely necessary in the world today. Plus, we have agility to adjust our course when necessary and to take responsibility for cleaning up any messes along the way. Because I don't know about you, but I'm a human being and I create messes. <laughs> so really, to be conscious, we have to develop ourselves. And what's required of us is to move beyond conditioning, patterns, buzzwords, and into embodiment through a series of core skills. This is where the rubber meets the road in our existence. Human development is a must do in our modern world. Time for an upgrade. If you're wondering about your roadmap for human development, these are some of your practices. These are the skills that are necessary for a new human operating system, such as the practice of presence, knowing when I'm present or not, or in drama, emotional intelligence, how to overcome fear, knowing your fear pattern, because we are a fear-based society. Emotional intelligence and overcoming fear is a key to resilience. We know scientifically that emotional ventilation is non-negotiable for resilience. So when you suppress your emotions, you affect your immune system, and you act out. We, know, we aren't satisfied in how we behave. We can shift from drama to productivity. How to communicate consciously. You're noticing communication has gone haywire. You know, unconscious bias and stereotyping. We're going to talk about that in a second. How to overcome imposter syndrome, that is cultivating healthy self-esteem. Having conscious commitments and clear agreements. These are just some of the skills that are necessary for the world today. I don't care if you work, don't work. If you're relating to someone in a modern world, you need these skills. Those are a lot of skills. <laughs> it is. And challenging ones, in fact. That's right. But it's just like any hobby. You have to practice, and that's what I, the point here is that you have to double down on human development now. Plus, all of the skills that I'm mentioning here and everything that I teach, and they're all in my book, you can have a copy when you leave, they're based in science, neuroscience, and biology. Why is that? This is where it gets wicked cool. <clears throat> and everybody's saying, why, why, why? Okay. Science has unlocked incredible insights into our brains and biology. So we know exactly why people behave the way they do. I know why I behave the way we do. So we get, but we get caught up in these mental debates. But just like two plus two equals four, the reasons behind our actions are crystal clear. You know, we're dynamic. This is like a biochemical event right here. We're all walking around biochemical events. That's what we are. And today, science just isn't, isn't just about understanding, it's about empowering us to make meaningful changes. So for example, this is where it gets really interesting. Hundreds of years ago, I'm going somewhere with this, stay with me. People who were convulsing were said to be possessed by demons and then were witches. Today we call that epilepsy. 
1966, Charles Whitman felt this gentleman, yeah, in Austin, Texas, felt there was something wrong with him. He's like, doctor, help me. I'm not feeling right. I'm having these thoughts. I feel off. Please help me. The doctor said, you're fine. Don't worry about it. It's all in your head. Nothing's wrong with you. He's, he's like, but come on, I'm not feeling right. It does, it's, it's just off. So you, they ignored him. So what did he do? He shot his mother and his wife. He climbed the Austin Tower, and he became a sniper. This is, this is quite famous. People have heard about this. He left, so then he was killed. He left his brain to science. What happened? They found a tumor. It was hitting his amygdala and in his brain. This is in 1966 now. So that started a wave of scientific research to show us how impacting our brain affects our behavior. So we know much more today. So now think 50 years from now. Because we are now point fingers saying people are racist, feminist, oppressors. We now call that implicit associations, bias, and stereotyping. The thing with today is we know why we behave the way we do, but we are ignoring it. A couple of hundred years ago, they didn't know that it was epilepsy. When Charles was shooting people, they didn't know what was happening in his brain. Today, we actually know. And let's talk a little bit more about that. Bias and stereotyping. We all do this. It's how we are wired. It's by design. Everyone has implicit biases and everyone stereotypes. Our brains are wired for this by design. Otherwise, life would be really difficult. In fact, it'd be almost dangerous. We wear a part, it's a part of that. We wear uniforms to, to distinguish ourselves into stereotypes. Sports is a great example, right? We know these are athletes and we wear uniforms. There's other uniforms we wear. This is useful. You can think of doctors wearing white coats because you know when a doctor has a coat, a white coat on, immediately, you don't have, your brain doesn't have to take all this time to think about it. You know that you're in, with a fire person or a doctor. So now think of yourself. Imagine you're injured and need to go to the hospital. Not too badly injured now. Just think about it. Now imagine you're in the hospital and needing surgery, something minor on your wrist, not something major, OK? Not to get you upset. <laughs> and here's your surgeon. Right? That's a chef. Your brain can't, wouldn't be able to make sense of that. So all of this stereotyping is by design. So your brain doesn't have to use, your brain is designed to use as little energy as possible. Your brain's wired for efficiency. So all of this is OK. But aside from uniforms, we have standard biases in society based on other factors. Now, everyone's asking me, yeah, what happened? That's right. Are you shocked? You know, are you wondering why in the history of our country we have yet to put a woman in the White House? Well, here's why. There are some typical common stereotypes and implicit associations. One of the major ones is male with career and female with family. So those are the associations we make. Another one is math, males are with math and science, female in the arts. This third one here is a big one. The success likability correlation is positive for men and negative for women. So when women become successful and powerful, we collectively, male and female, get really, really uncomfortable with that. We actually get scared. There's an association in the US of white equals American and black equals violence. This is hardwired into our brains. So I'm telling you this because we have to stop judging it. And there's also an association of Asians are good at math. If you remember, a Andrew Yang had a pin that said math on it. He was doing that to break that bias. And what's important to know about this is this is how stereotypes work. We see someone, 
we assign them to a group, then we assign the behaviors of that group to them. When they act in that way, our brains are very comfortable. So our brains say, okay, I'm safe. Such as parents, a heterosexual couple and as parents. But you have, for instance, a gay couple with kids. Our brain says, nope, we sh people should be heterosexual. That's who should have kids. There's danger. So we actually get into a sympathetic nervous system response. We don't attack, but we oppress, we belittle. That's where all of this behavior comes from. Here's another one. Men are engineers. I hear this in the tech world all the time. I do a lot of coaching in tech. And it's like, OK, we associate engineers as men. I actually was coaching some, I uh, was part of a startup. I was an advisor. And the founder said, oh, men are engineers. Like it was fact. That's just the bias at work. So then when we see female engineers, we get uncomfortable with that. So we don't promote them. We don't, uh, we don't hire them, right? We suppress. So try not to judge it. This is who we are. The first part is to expose this. And then, of course, the biggest one. We see leaders and CEOs as white men, square jaw white men. So anything other than that, we get uncomfortable with. And we actually go into a fear response so we don't vote, we suppress, we judge clothing, the whole thing. So if you're wondering why we don't have a, ha a woman in the White House, this is why. There's many other reasons, but this is at the core of it. It's pretty amazing you had Obama in the White House. That's right. That was a, that was, that's right. That was a first step towards a non-white, you know, towards someone other than a white male. And this is not about white male bashing, not at all. But it's about bringing equality. Our brains are not wired for this, but you can reprogram them. You're just saying this is cultural because other countries have women presidents or heads of state, right? They do, they do, yeah. So it's a, it's a number of things, like, but this is at the core of it. But yeah, you know, it depends on how the culture then can warm up to having a woman in charge in a place of power. Furthermore, if we get into even more, the brain is fascinating. Then anyone who's not in the stereotype that my brain's com comfortable with, that's already, they're already a them. So our brains are wired for us versus them. Our brains are not wired for love and unity. We see people and we don't go, oh, I love you right away. You're one of me. I'm sure you're just like me. Immediately what we go is you're a them. And I, I, I cringe when I hear this hate speech, because hate speech isn't really born from hate. It's born from fear. There's this, we're not born to hate. We're not born to hate. But we are born to survive. This organism's sole purpose is to survive. So not only does the brain stereotype, but here's something else fascinating. You might be familiar with the friend or foe analysis that happens. That's a survival mechanism. So what happens, the brain sees somebody and immediately says, is it an us or them? And then if it's an us, if it's an us and it's there's me who's part of us, then automatically there's a them to fight with, a them to go against. It's probably, you're probably like, okay, this is easy, <laughs> you know, it's easy to see this coming to light with our current political situation. And what's amazing is our brains divide people into us versus them in stunning speed, in just 50 milliseconds. Seeing someone of a different race triggers the part of the brain that reacts to fear or threat in milliseconds. The brain also sorts people by gender or social status just as quickly. So that's what happens. We see another person's face. We say or they an us or them. And right away, if it's an us, then OK, it's us. And then we have to find thems to fight against. And look, it's absolutely OK to want to be part of any group. We're social animals, after all. However, when the cost of being part of a group is your integrity, your values, the truth, the well-being of everyone, 
or being part of something exclusive has the potential to be for toxicity, harmful behavior, and systemic discrimination. And here's some examples. You probably have seen this as you think about, you know, different groups. We we favor us's and put them down. <laughs> We forgive us's and we're really hard on them. So with anyone who's an us, we let things slide. But they shouldn't, they can't get away with anything. We tolerate us's and we, we ignore them. We view us as good. So anyone's an us in our in-group is great. They're allowed to do anything. Them's, they're just downright evil. So the fact that they're breathing are just, they're downright evil. We're more open to us's and close to them. We hire us's and don't hire them. We vote for us's. <laughs> we don't vote for them's. I mean, I'm just amazed how people silo each other within their company or society. And then you learn, you, we, we leave off the table the benefits of diversity and learning from each other. Even conscious versus unconscious can be an us them. These are some in the workforce. Extroverts, introverts. I mean, these are some of the innocuous ones. And instead of rebooting ourselves and developing ourselves, there's a lot of blaming and shaming that starts. That's what makes diversity and gender, diversity, race, gen and gender such radioactive topics. We start the blame game. Instead of understanding this is how our brain works, so let me try to rewire some of this. We start the blame game. It's almost a weaponization. And drama is a waste of time. It's all motion and no progress. So you're likely seeing how science can support us in educating ourselves and how we relate together. What about this? What about all the alternative, alternative facts and disinformation? What actually is the truth? So we just chose our next president. And if you're like me, you're pretty exhausted by the campaign. And in our day and age, fact checkers are required not only to see who's lying, but actually to see how much people are lying. When I heard either candidate say the American people want X, Y, Z, I cringe because they never asked me. Did they ask any of you? So did they go around and ask every American what they thought? Of course they didn't. And here's what you need to know. The brain contextualizes everything. As human beings, we don't talk fact to fact. We never say coat epoxy vest, coat epoxy coat, because I just bought a new coat epoxy. And I hope that's how you say it. It's hanging up there. We don't talk that way. Glasses, no glasses. We, we just don't. I mean, our brains are not wired to speak fact to fact. Imagine how boring conversations would be. It'd be pretty boring, actually. But what happens then is what comes out of our mouth is anything but facts and truth. It's then opinions, judgments, projections, intuitions, thoughts, ideas. These are all non-truths that we treat as facts. So the fact that we do that is OK, but you're likely seeing the implications. Because if I say something, it's OK to speak ideas or thoughts or judgments or opinions, but we treat those as facts when they aren't. They're non-truths. They're just that, an opinion. And then we get locked into a position about that. Then, because our brain contextualizes everything, this happens. We end up using you statements or the blame-shame game. <laughs> You know, you can think about how effective finger pointing is. You know, drama's exhausting. You need to. You should. And here's my favorite, and we were talking about this early. If only you would be different, my life would be fantastic. By engaging in the blame game, the boxing gloves come out, and we're sparring, even in the most minor of conflicts. That's why we end up stuck in the drama triangle. It's like spinning your wheels, tons of action, Zero progress. Drama doesn't just drain productivity, it zaps your connections too. It's a sneaky way to dodge the hard stuff, like those tough conversations we all dread, or reaching across the aisle to the other side, to thems. 
Instead of facing things head on, we gossip, complain, and stay stuck. Does this sound familiar? Probably. Maybe you're even thinking of a tricky situation that you've dealt with, or a family member, or that coworker. <laughs> You know, and you're like, oh, so that's why they act that way. Wow, they're really in a lot of drama. That in and of itself is a form of drama. Look at how much drama they're in. But here's the thing. It's OK. We fall into this trap. It's crazy, but we fall into it. We're human. The good news is we've got the power to flip the switch. The opportunity is right here. Put the oxygen mask on yourself first, refocus, and choose clarity over chaos. And on this, what you're really aiming for, for the truth now, is your inner outer expression to match your inner experience. This re requires us to disregard the virtual reality by our in our minds and to speak what's true from a place of presence. Otherwise, we swirl in mental thoughts. We make up stories. And these mental stories aren't real. But here's the thing. We actually start to align our actions around these stories. This happens even with positive interactions. We just don't notice it, though, because they're not high stakes. These thoughts then actually lead to stress and an actual fear response in our bodies, all based on a series of thoughts made up in our mind that aren't real. You can probably relate to this, the mental swirl. Our bodies then are get ready to defend itself one way or another. This gives rise to harmful behaviors. Whenever I hear someone say that was weird or bizarre, strange, um, crazy, cray cray, I know that someone's brain has been hijacked at some level. And when this happens, we aren't speaking the truth. So that's where compassion comes in. Because <clears throat> if someone is attacking you verbally, it doesn't feel good, but they are hijacked. And it's important to understand that. All because we stay unconscious of our behavior, we refuse to educate ourselves about our brains. We don't hit the reboot button of our humanity. And then now get a load of this. This is super fascinating. Have you ever wondered why doing the right thing is so difficult? Or, or having others do the right thing? It's because it is harder. You're not crazy. Here's what science teaches us about the brain and conforming. Our brains are biased to go along, to get along, in less than a second. Our sensory processing regions are even pressured to experience what is not true all to fit in. Isn't that amazing? In less than a second, wired to go along, to get along. And in the brain, belonging equals safety, because we all want to belong. Realizing you took a different action than a group, the fear response activates. And the chance you will change your mind to match the group increases exponentially. So belonging is safety. So here's more on this. Being different equals being wrong. When everyone disagrees with you, now think about when, you, when everyone disagreed with you if you were in a group or your family or society, anywhere. So when everyone disagrees with you, your brain activates a complex fear response. Therefore, the brain considers you not only to be different, but that you are wrong. The greater the activation of fear in your brain, the more likely you are to conform to the group, even if you are correct. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we experience anxiety when we equate differentness with wrongness. We get stressed out. We get into another fear um, pattern. And to alleviate this, this anxiety, we change our opinion. We just follow orders. So we know this now. So we don't have to say, why does he? Why does she? Why do I? Why didn't I push back? Because it's harder. It takes more energy. And we actually go into a fear response in our brain. It's remarkable, isn't it? Isn't it super cool? I mean, that we know that. It's awful. 
<laughs> it's just ridiculously awful. But now that we know that, we can talk about it on teams in our family. So science is our friend and can support us in rebooting. And another thing, <laughs> never underestimate the impact of breathing. When you exhale and inhale, <clears throat> you engage your parasympathetic nervous system, your rest and digest system. You can see this quote. The brain represents 2% of the human body weight and consumes 15% 15 per, 15 of the cardiac output and 20% of total body oxygen, 10 times more than any of your muscles. So you want your prefrontal cortex in, in, on board. Whether you're shopping at the store, at the co-op, or talking to your family, or in a, a serious conversation, you want your entire brain engaged. So make sure you're breathing all day. That's the first thing I do with my clients. I'm like, are you breathing? Is it shallow? Yes or no? If not, start breathing. Yeah, so everybody take a breath right now. <sighs> Without breathing, your existence will be just like when your screen locks up on any of your devices. So thanks to science, we can reboot our humanity. And you start with you. Where to begin? Take some time out of your day to reallocate it to upgrading your operating system. These are your skills. My book is there. You can have a copy. There's enough for all of you. We aren't taught these skills in school, college, or anywhere. Again, social skills, that's what these are. Skills to help us relate and navigate the human condition in a global open gig economy, open society, open globe. This is your new operating system. And you practice, just like any hobby. Think of any of your favorite hobby. What did you do the first time you started it? You weren't a pro. You had repetitions, right? That's what this is. Repetitions. Just try, pick listening. Read my book and try listening for a That's a wicked fun. That's a wicked fun experiment. Is that you don't do any talking. You just listen to people for, try it for a day, first of all. But if you can do that for a week, you'll be amazed. Your friends will fall in love with you. Your family will fall way back in love with you. I mean, just try that. That's one of the hardest ones up there. Yeah, right, right? Everyone gets it. Yeah, just try, try, try it for a day. Try it for, you know, maybe half a day. If you can go a week, that's really masterful. These are some of the skills. There's many more. Really, the result is agility, connection, peace, and even the awareness to say, wow, I'm really overwhelmed right now. I'm not doing well. I can't handle this group. I can't handle this conversation. I can't handle this relationship. I need to retreat. That's OK, too. So becoming more conscious is really a journey. It's not a once and done. It's a winding path of growth and self-discovery. And just like that, the journey of connecting with others is an ongoing adventure. It's a grand experiment. Both take time and tension and a willingness to embrace the process of it all. Each step forward, each lesson learned deepens our awareness and strengthens, actually, our relationships. So some of the tough conversations is an opportunity to learn and grow together. There's no finish, in, finish line, just infinite opportunities to grow, connect, and evolve. And I'll say there's no better classroom than life, there's no better lab and classroom than life itself, whether it's family, society, a marriage, a business, any group that we're in. Dive in, experiment, make mistakes, do great things, learn and keep moving forward. The beauty of it all is we're not supposed to be perfect. We're human beings. You can take responsibility for any mistakes, clean it up, and move on. We just have to make space for our full, messy, amazing humanity. Stop judging others. Understand that it's their brain and biochemistry at work. Not take it personally, but have boundaries. Like any skill, navigating the challenges of today's world takes practice. It's, again, it's no different than a hobby, something we keep working on, getting better at. And I will say, too, becoming a skillful, masterful human being, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for weak, the weak mind. 
because it requires us to step out of the blame game, the blame shame game, and to take responsibility for our behavior. Every day becomes an opportunity to sharpen our skills, elevate our awareness, and make choices that shape the life and the world around us. So the path isn't easy. It's a challenge that calls for a lot of courage, resilience, and a fierce commitment to personal growth. But for me, that's where it gets exciting. In a modern world where humanity needs conscious leaders and skillful human beings, more than ever, taking on this challenge means you're not just making your life better, you're connecting to something bigger than yourself. You're not just a participant in the world, but you're a key player shaping the future with every choice and action. So buckle up. It's time to evolve. Questions or comments? Yeah. Challenges? <laughs> I love when I'm challenged. Well, I, it's so appropriate for right now. I mean, given this last week and, and, and just the, it's like what you're presenting is just this lens on what's going on, you know, what's going on within each of us sometimes or in, in community and in society. It's like, wow, what else is possible here? Mm -hmm. Because we're seeing a lot of the negative uh, arising and there's got to be some solutions and this is that, yeah. you know, like take responsibility for what you're putting mm -hmm. out there. So it's really, it's really kind of great to, <laughs> we just need to fill the room to, uh, you know, it's really appropriate to, to just now on the planet. It's not for the faint of heart, like I said. It's easier to get in, drama is highly addictive. It's easier to blame and shame than it is to say, well, how am I contributing to this? But it's way more satisfying to take responsibility. Oh my gosh. Well, what, what really resonated for me is the idea of like, this is a, a human system, a set of human systems that are all being brought up and activated. Yeah. Right? From the sympathetic to the parasympathetic to, you know, the, the fear responses and yeah. all these, all these sort of structures and processes that are in place. And when I just just listening to that, I just had this thought of like, you know, there's so many people who are part of these large societal and cultural systems, you know, that that really support. It makes it really easy for them and for me. In the ones that I'm in, to be small-minded or to be scared or mm -hmm. to be uh, to feel uh, afraid, right? There's a lot of fear. Yeah. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of anxiety, and so it's like this, it's like a, there's a systems mindset that that um, is appropriate both at the cultural and societal level, but also on the personal responsibility level. Mm -hmm. And that seems like there's some some an interesting opportunity there. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I didn't bring that in because that would be a whole different way. But we know the, the we know the source of all anxiety, stress, whatever you want to call it, fear is loss of control and lack of predictability. Yeah. What does that equal? Ambiguity and uncertainty. So for a human being, it, I what I myself is you need to understand your relationship to uncertainty and ambiguity, because it, for instance, artificial intelligence is changing a lot of the way we exist. We have a new president, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. There's wars in Ukraine, there's, you know, China might invade Taiwan, so there's a lot of uncertainty. So we go into a fear response on that when we don't calm down our nervous systems, literally. Abby, you keep saying we're wired this way, and then there's this part of me that says, and I mean, so when we're born, so here are these little newborn baby, We've been around them in one form or another, and then there's, uh, and then there's what's around them. Yeah, and I mean, so it occurs, you know, rather than thinking of that, all that wiring's in there. I mean, it's in there as a possibility, but will be shaped by the conversations that the are around these little Absolutely. beings. Absolutely, and and that. Uh, I mean, I, I'm experiencing a lot, and maybe all of you are, but you know, that, that we're going back and checking to see where these conversations originated that have me be very fearful or mean, or you know, that, that it was really my original caregivers too that were, were um, 
showing me that. You know, I, I mean, kind of modeling it. Environment. Yeah, environment. So anyway, I, I the wiring, you know, we're wired this way versus we're we're kind of trained this way, you know, given the conversation, speak into that, if you will. Both yeah, well, and, yes and. So, yeah, yeah, so we're, we come out of our moms clean, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, clean, clean. <laughs> fresh. I don't think I did. Well, well yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other thing, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, so you're influenced, so we're, so we're influenced. My mom was a drinker, alcoholic. Oh, yeah, there you go, yeah. I was two months premature, I just wanted to get Yeah, the bingo, out. so there you go, so, so it matters, like, what, right. what your mom is doing. So if your mom, my mom happened to be stressed, she was tense, very, very tense, so I came out quick because I'm like, get me out of here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So there's that. But then after you come out, then absolutely your brain development doesn't stop till 25. So it, what, get, what you see starts to get wired. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, whatever you're witnessing starts to get wired. Mm -hmm. It's the operating system that you're talking about. Yeah, that's right. It gets mm -hmm. wired. You get mm -hmm. installed. Yep. So if all you see is white people, mm -hmm. Then you're, you know, and you're wired. Yeah, then you're wired. <laughs> you're born with the survival instinct, right? Well, the, and we're then always it gets reinforced. By always, yeah. So we're right. this, like I said, this this whole form. We're cave. We're all cave people. Mm -hmm. We're all walking around like there's a lion here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, but that's the opportunity because we're safe now, mm -hmm. right? Now, some places aren't. Yeah. You know, but generally speaking, we're not cave people. Mm -hmm. You know, we have modern medicine and all that. Mm -hmm. The exciting thing is you can rewire all of this. Yeah. That's what's really exciting, is we know that the brain, you can change the synapses and you can rewire all of this. That's chapter uh, eight, under commitments. Mm -hmm. That's what chapter eight addresses. You can, and like, just, just also, you know, I've just like, look, our parents, and some of your parents, right? Our parents did the best they could. So it's like none of us were seen when we were kids. We haven't learned how to raise kids in a modern world, really. And so they're going to have stuff. It's OK. Like, who cares, right? Our parents did the best they could. Then it's as adults, it's our responsibility to say, OK, what patterns do I have? And what patterns do I want to rewire to be the person that I really am? That's chapter eight, commitments. Because in the absence of conscious commitments, our unconscious patterns come forward. So I'm curious, Abby, about you know it, the era of the last you know 15, 20 years of really that the 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 hanging on from young people not really necessarily relating in the same in the way that that prior we had to because these phones kind of divorce divorce us from a, that kind of reality of one on one. And so I'm just curious what you're finding in terms of this evolving and the rebooting uh, around technology <clears throat> that's kind of really come in. And I mean, I, I can't relate the same way to a grandson who spends most of his time on his phone. He's not really interested. I mean, there, you know, inside the culture, there isn't any reason why he should relate another way. Yeah, we're, that's why I kind of call it a grand experiment because we haven't seen the other side of that yet. But we, uh, we, know for, we know, for instance, that you shouldn't have kids looking at a, at a phone, at a screen, that, if, that impacts their development. I have a friend who have a grandchild who heard speech, it was impeded because she was look, looking too much at screens. So all that impacts that. <clears throat> we haven't seen the other side of that yet. But here at the source of that is, so I talked about loss of control and lack of predictability. So what we know today is that the brain wants to predict. So when, when things are predictable, the brain is calm and says, OK, the organism is safe. If anything is unpredictable, the brain says, OK, there's danger. So much so. So for instance, that's why we choose the leader who may be chaotic, harmful, and dangerous but predictable over the present leader who is unpredictable because we don't know what's going to happen. This is also why people would rather pay. So the brain can't be still because being stillness is the unknown and it's unpredictable. So that's why people would rather pay to shock themselves with an electric shock than be still. 
when I ask executives to just be still, they're like, I'd rather poke needles in my eyes. So the skill there is to, because the brain wants to go into a fear response, so the skill is to actually be still, not even meditate, but just be still and let the, the, the wave of like fear come up because the brain is saying there's danger, that we don't know what's going to happen. That's a caveman instinctual thing. So I strengthen my, my mind by going on silent retreat or just being still. And so I can just power through the unpredictability. Do you think there's a, um, an advantage in people who are uh, amongst people who are not part of the status quo? You know, who are not rewarded by the current system? That maybe the, the people who are, you know, the, I mean, the, the artists, you know, like I'm a weirdo theater person. And I wonder, like I've, I've always, I've never been on the inside of like, well, you're a them. You know? Well, th then you're a them. Well, and I, I mean, I wonder if there's like an advantage in doing this work because they're already like <clears throat> more open to or just challenged by the system that there is. You know, for. Uh, um, don't quite, yeah. So I'm, f I'm not quite tracking. I, I'm thinking like yeah, for, so. for folks who are artists and queer and, you know, like repressed and on the yeah. outs outside, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Progressives and, and, and goofballs of all kinds and weirdos. Uh, I wonder if there's an advantage in, in, in this work because they're already used to having to just do stuff just to get along. Yeah, I think I, so I recommend these skills because so, you know, I was a female on Wall Street. OK, so I had, you know, otherwise I get into the blame game and get victim. -y. But if I'm really skillful and conscious, then I can meet what's coming at me and know when to retreat. So anyone who's not the mainstream is a them. So now we have collective thems, right? So the LGBT community, or transgender even, let's go there, they're definite thems to society. So I recommend people who are any kind of them to a major group really get skillful as a human being because you're swimming upstream. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm saying is that, yeah. that there's that there might already be more practice at doing this kind of work. Well, more yeah. suited to it, but like more able. Well, they're going to be more available because they have more to deal with. You know, yeah. they have more to deal with, right? Yeah, yeah. for sure, mm -hmm. for sure. Any minority has probably more opportunity for that practice. So totally. it's, it's up just, to them if they choose to practice. And almost, I mean, almost like it's almost like life. It's it's part of like survival is to be skillful. Yeah. But even then, even then, they get into the blame shame game. It's like. When I get discriminated in any way, I'm like, that's not, it's not personal, but it's not personal. Their brain is hijacked. They're just stereotyping me. That doesn't mean I'm like, oh, that's okay. It's like, okay, got to put up a strong boundary mm -hmm. because they're unconscious, not aware of their stereotyping, not able to recover it, not able to call it out. That's where strong boundaries and skill come in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then the blame, but I don't, I don't blame anybody. There's the blame shame goes away. I'm like, okay, yeah. what are they available for? If they're not available for a conversation about what it means to be a human being, boundary goes up, I'm going to go to people that are. That's great. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm smart. I'm just, you don't throw yourself to the sharks. And you also don't blame the shark. Yeah, that's right. Blaming shaming, there's no point in blaming shaming. There's a book called How to Swim with the Sharks. By yeah. Okay, I think it was. Yeah. Back when. Yeah. And I don't know. I've if heard I, of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's or not. But yeah. <laughs> I've been on Wall Street and high tech. So yeah. Okay. So you right. Look. And I didn't like the the bro stuff. Yeah. I really so you did got, not like right. That so I'm a them to the bros. Yeah. I'm a them to the brokers. You know, you learn adaptive strategies, but it does. You know, that's smart and intelligent. But, but really, you know, it's even bigger now because we are connected across yeah. the globe. We do have people from China talking to people from the U.S. And they have a different culture than we do. So we have polar bears and elephants are interacting now. With that, we, then we need skill. And then I think of uh, uh, nonviolent communication, giraffes. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we to, it's even like we have to do, we have to be more skillful. I mean, it's just it's even more serious than that now. 
Not about the communication, it feels like I'm just right in this wheelhouse in terms of one of these skills. Yeah, so, what, so one of the things, so that's where new neuroscience is out. Like we know now that we don't speak the truth. Like we know the brains just don't speak the truth. We contextualize everything. So I, I never so about contextualizing, caveat, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, so it's like, <clears throat> you know, like the candidates, they're saying the American people want. They didn't poll every American person, you know. Or I have opinions about things, right? But I'll say that's my opinion or that's my experience rather than making something true. That's so the difference. Is kind of making an assumption about it, it's falling in a particular category, I mean, yeah. into a context. Yeah. American public's on that. Here's another thing. When, when humans are asked a question and they don't know the answer, the brain answers a different question. I always watch out for that. If someone asks me a question, and, I, and I've answered it a different question, I'm like, OK, that's my brain taking over, rather than saying I don't know. I'm pretty good at the debate. Yeah, I was going to say that sounds like one or another of the <laughs> that's, candidates. That's called media, <laughs> yeah, media you training. Want just yeah. a straight answer. That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. I mean, the debate, the, the debate, like watching politicians is a really good arena for drama and all that. Like, they mm -hmm. don't. Sp they certainly don't speak the truth, but they're in drama. They're in hero, victim, and villain. They're not even like, you know, there's a level of awareness that, okay, it's not what I'm saying. There's a, con there's a context that what I'm saying is not the truth, but we don't have to say every time. This is not true, but, but they're just in hero, victim, and villain. That's why nothing gets done. And a little empathy on either side, toward the other side. Yeah. Uh, speaking of neuroscience, what does neuroscience say about uh, empathy, because I think a lot of brick walls uh, with communication kind of end with zero empathy. Yeah. And, so <laughs> and is that nature or nurture, or and also can you correct that, or can you improve on that? Yeah. So empathy. So actually, there's a biochemical and biological neuro neurological difference between empathy and compassion. So empathy means to put yourself in each other in another person's shoes. So if I'm stressed out. Let's say I've just had an accident, which I did actually. So let's say I just had an accident with a fender bender, I'm okay. But let's say I had an accident and someone comes up to me. I'm in distress. My physiology is, is stressed, right? So I'm in a fear response, sympathetic nervous system response. If someone puts themselves in my shoes, then we have two distressed peoples. That person is less likely to be able to help me because now they're in a stress response. Yeah, but I, I Sales, and I was quite empathetic, and, and it helped me in sales because I could put myself in their shoes and sort of respond to the possible questions that they might have based on their actions. And what yeah, they said. No, I, I, yeah, right. Is that a I, different kind of. Yeah, I, I kind of consider Depends that. Depends if you sold them things they don't need. <laughs> no, I, no, well, that's the reason why I wanted to. I kind of call out. that relating. <laughs> that's relating. So that's where we mirror and we relate and we like, yeah, so you must be feeling. That's why. I, so. No, not really like that because that sounds too, I don't know, um, salesy. <laughs> well, it's, but you know. I just wanted to, I tried to put myself in their shoes based on their position. It's called company, manipulation. What their needs might be, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's that's more like. That's okay because not, the person's not distressed. You're having a conversation, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, that's good. Like, so I can imagine what this person might need. That's like almost altruism and trying to meet no, them. Yeah. That's mirroring. That's, yeah, that's how we relate. So that's not empathy? No, empathy is really like, um, has to do with really putting yourself in another person's shoes when they're distressed. When that, that's the you key. know, okay. when they're distressed. The key, the key mm -hmm. is that if they're distressed, so if you put yourself in another person's shoes, that's fine. But if they're distressed in a stress response, you can pick that up. Okay. Okay. Whereas compassion is a detached <laughs> empathy. I'm here. I see you. What support do you need, etc. This is what AI says. Empathy is the ability to understand and vicariously experience another person's feelings. It has three components. 
cognitive empathy, the ability to understand the emotional experience of the others while remaining detached. Sympathy. Yeah. The ability to feel what other person, what another person is experiencing, and compassion, the ability to feel concern for others. Yeah. So that so that's an AI answer. Yeah. So that, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. So that's what so what's cool about it is that uh, that's right. All this neuroscience is getting us clearer and clearer on what empathy, compassion is, and all of that. So the, the neuroscience and the science will get us clearer and clearer on that. Well, and the, and, and the point is to be able to recognize for ourselves yeah. and for others what, they're, what we're going through and what they're going mm -hmm. through, and then, and then respond appropriately. Yeah, rather not than get hooked. Just it's, acting out in yeah. that. So. That's, that's really it in a nutshell, is not to get hooked by, because we do get hooked by each other. So if I'm in a fear response, if you're not conscious, your biochemistry will pick up on that. That's really in a nutshell. So we just had dinner, right? And my five-year-old is um, continually not <laughs> listening to us. Mm -hmm. And then when we bring out the food that my wife just prepared, she goes, my daughter looks at, she only eats noodles and bread. <laughs> oh, good for her and just the carbs. White, yeah. white food. I want her. I want her diet. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. She can get away with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and she gets, she looks at this big uh, the skillet chili that my wife made. It was good, beautiful, it was an amazing meal. And she goes, yuck. Right. And my wife goes, hey, so that actually made me feel really bad. And my daughter's like not listening or something. And both of us get angry at her because we're like, she's not paying attention. She's not recognizing that we're trying to reach her right now. Yeah. You know, and so then we both, I said, listen, you got to pay attention. And she goes, and I, and, and then she, she like tried to get away from it somehow and did a little like, blah, blah, you know, like trying to diffuse or whatever. And I was like, listen to your mother. And she went, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and it like turned into this whole thing Drama. because we, yeah, we got, I got sucked into her response. And then she was like, she, she literally said, um, you don't love me. <laughs> you know? Drama. Drama, yeah. <laughs> totally. I mean, you know, your brain's, your daughter's brain is forming, you know, and all that. And she's learning how to attach and un unattach. She's yeah. growing up. And in a nutshell, too, like anger, so that's um, emotional intelligence. So when you're feeling angry, it's like saying, I feel angry. And like, what do I have a no for? So then instead of saying, listen or whatever, you can ask, would you be willing to? You know, I know she's still only five, but, but look, I mean, I would let yourself, that's what I'm saying, like, oh, totally. let yourself off the hook. I, I mean, just, if, it's like, it's, you have it's two kids, constant. yeah, that's two kids. So I would just say, like, let them grow up and they'll look back and they'll sure. be like, they did the best they could and all that. Like, so I just sure. give yourself a huge. But, but a lot of the stuff feels like, also, it's like, this is, this is the work of, of, you know, raising a good human. Well, it is, it is. like, most, so, you know, most, in my family, you never showed emotions. That is the most unhealthy thing you can ever do. It affects your immune system, your resilience drops. It's not the truth of your experience. And then you grow up and become like a nutcase because you're, you're not, you haven't emoted, okay? We went through a pandemic. We just went through a pandemic, it's been years now. But I asked people like, when's the last time you got mad? Oh, I don't get mad. We just, we're in the middle of a freaking pandemic and you're not at all pissed off. You know, that, that's just so unhealthy. So if you, yeah, it's unhealthy. Imagine someone dying. Nope, no emotions. I got another idea for you, primal screen therapy. Yeah, that's all, yep, primal yeah. screen therapy. That's really good, actually, yeah. I've done that. It's yeah. really good, because you're moving energy, yeah. especially anger energy and fear energy. I've done that. It's really, really useful. They, have, they actually have rage rooms now. Yeah. Yeah, you get you dress that was on the show. I watch the show Billions. I don't know why because it triggers me for <laughs> Wall Street, but it's really good. But Taylor, this character, put she went to a rage room to move the anger. So she put on all this gear and takes a sledgehammer. And there's rooms where you just go and slash yeah, stuff. Master. That's good use of ang of moving anger energy. Anger is a tough one. So Abby, a word that I missed on on your really amazing presentation was integrity. I, you know, inter and I'm wondering what that is for you um, versus, you know, that wasn't a word that came into my vocabulary until I was nearly 50, that there was something about being my word and, and being, you know, and, mm. and being true, sort of true to my word, giving my word and being that. Yeah. And I just, you know, it, it seems like that's one of the, the skills 
uh, that would be helpful in empowering leaders, conscious leadership? Yes, yeah, so if, I kind of don't use the word integrity <clears throat> because everything, all the skills together put me in integrity. Okay. I'm present, so I'm not in drama. I'm, t I'm presenting my authentic self. I'm not wearing a persona of hero, victim, villain. Yeah. I'm telling the truth yeah. in that this is an opinion, not fact. Right. You know, what's, so there's a chapter on clear agreements. Yeah. I do what I say I'm going to do. I don't do what I say yeah. I'm not going to, you know, like, so I make clear so agreements. So you're making that, uh, <clears throat> and, and without necessarily calling that forth and, yeah. and saying this, this is really my, my roadmap about it's being integrous with myself. Yeah, into, yeah, yeah, that's an outcome. Mm -hmm. And so. part, of, part of like living in alignment with my values and I'm congruent. So then I'm in alignment. I, I like the word alignment, alignment, but all of this puts me in integrity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, no lying, cheating, stealing, yeah. or telling the truth about that and making amends. Guys, we are lying, cheating, and stealing. Yeah, this that's is, right. This We're is liars, our awesome cheaters, business cheaters. that we get to do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know. We're liars, stealers, and cheaters. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's like, so, you know, it's very satisfying to be in alignment mm -hmm. and to tell the truth. It's really scary for people, but I sleep at night. Like, I'm very satisfied in how I, I, clean, I clean up my messes. I tell the truth, I clean up my messes. It's extremely satisfying. Well, I'm finding that this, this, in this week after the election, we're getting, and a lot with Main Street Media, we're getting a lot of not cleaning up, you know, like not being willing to look at what, you know, I mean, be, being more in drama and in upset than in taking responsibility, you know, and then an occasional um, anchor person or whatever will say, you know, really, we have something to learn from here. This is, a, you know, there, there's, there's information here. And if we're caught over here, blah, 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 we don't get that information. And I think that's, you know, this is a perfect time for starting to look at what's in alignment and not. I agree. I mean, I think life and leadership today requires more examination. But I said it's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. <clears throat> then you have to stop and say, how am I behaving? How am I acting? <clears throat> I mean... I don't want to start a rabbit hole, but I can't imagine Trump's inner life. <clears throat> His inner life, he's probably so disconnected from himself. And I'm not justifying anything, but I can't imagine being so far disconnected from myself and dissociated. And, you know, here we are. <laughs> uh, and I'm, not, I, I, I'm a, not a proponent of good, bad, right, wrong. I'm like done with that. Yeah. Just drop that language from, I, I've just dropped it from my vocabulary. <clears throat> this is good shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that feels like a good closer, don't you think? Thank you so much.